1579. The seven provinces of the Low Countries signed the Union of Utrecht, creating a new republic in Europe. But the move makes little impact, for their lands are occupied by Spain. The Republic engages in the Eighty Years' War for independence. As the war continues, Dutch traders, especially those of the Dutch East India Company, establish trading networks that make the United Provinces a vital trade partner for all European powers. 1609. Spain finally recognizes the United Provinces as the region's government, but remains at war for the territory. The war spills out of Europe. The technically advanced Dutch fleets are found the world over, damaging the Spanish Empire at every turn and making the United Provinces extremely rich through trade. 1623 Following the successes of the East India Company, the West India Company is formed to control and expand Dutch trade in the Americas and Western Africa, specialising in the transport of sugar and slaves. 1648 at the Peace of Westphalia, the war is finally concluded, with the United Provinces victorious, now a fully independent nation. 1674. After a long period of war and trading difficulties, the West India Company is dissolved, having ultimately failed to make the United Provinces the leading power in the Americas. 1700. Unable to allow Spain, France and Britain to dominate in the West, a charter is created for the foundation of a second West India Company. The leaders of the United Provinces, the Stadtholders, one of whom, King Willem, just so happens to be the King of England, meet at the capital, Amsterdam, to discuss the new venture. Well, there is another way to do it, but it isn't the way of the man who wants results. I was shocked when I read the charters my governors in Britain use, they, perhaps like you, Mr. de Groot, questioned the value of a trade monopoly, so much so that they allowed the various properties of their companies to compete internally. No doubt a strategy good for certain members of the guilds, but in truth I see no merit to it. You are quite right, Your Highness. Let all be assured that much thought has been had on the matter, and none have managed to compel any of wit to the arguments against monopoly. We must keep the charter as it is. Let the new company follow the example of its eastern cousin in aiming for nothing short of total control. Well said, Mr. Grave. Let the charter stand. Please, Mr. Grave, read back to us the charter as it is written now so that we may assess how pleasing it rings. We, the States General, authorise by this charter the creation of the Second West India Company, hereafter referred to as the Company. To the company we grant the mandate of our proud republic to establish, on behalf of the noble stadtholders of the seven provinces, a monopoly on all acquisition, trafficking and merchanting of any and all resources deemed to be of economic interest to the republic. To this end, we grant unto the directors of said company the authority to, in the theatre delimited by this charter, conduct any operation related to the completion of the company's specified mission, up to and including military action against parties not already entreated with the Republic. The chosen directors must report to the Director General assigned by the Stadtholders, Corbus Lodovics, in all matters of palpable concern. The Director General will escort the grant of military resources to be dispatched to the company's primary theatre at the time of the signing of this charter. Following is the agreed delimitation of the company's area of authority. Action is to be taken no further east than the Cape of Good Hope, no further north than the Strait of Gibraltar, and no further west than Cape Horn. Well, General, can we be sure then? I think so, sir. They said it would have that church with the dome on top, and there it is as clear as day. So this is certainly Antigua? I'm certain, Mr. Lodovics. And those fellows then? They, sir, I would presume, would be what remains of the first West India Company. Something tells me they would rather there wasn't a second. Let's just hope the temptation of piracy has not swept Admiral Calimber. If he is the sea dog I remember, we shall soon be at his mercy if he wishes it. Anyway, I'm afraid I must ask you to dampen their aspirations, General Van Nassau, 
for my contract explicitly states that the headquarters for my administration is to be in Antigua, and to violate the contract will surely- Don't worry, Mr. Lorovix. The matter is as good as settled. Good. Good. That's all we want to hear. If you'll excuse me, I shall wait at the back until you are done. Good profit to you. Very good, sir. I shall return shortly. Colonel! Colonel! Send word to the guns. Welcome to Sinews of War, a United Provinces campaign for Empire Total War with Darth Maul. The first thing you'll notice is that as the first battle rages, I'm filming the footage of me actually fighting the battle for the first time, rather than the replays, as I usually do, because in Empire Total War the replays aren't all that good. They're very inaccurate, in fact, and I wasn't able to get an accurate reconstruction of the battle, so we're going to do this one live. I'm starting this battle as we fight for Antigua by having my artillery bombard the town we can just about see some pirate forces inside who will need to defeat. The pirates have mortars in the town, advanced artillery, that are basically denying us the chance to advance on the town itself because they'll inflict very heavy casualties on my infantry. Right now, they're firing at me, but they're out of range. They don't seem to know this. So they're kind of usefully showing me their range by just dropping shots in the fields in front of me, denying me the chance to advance, but at least letting me know my limits. Their officer seems to believe he has a telescope, which might suggest he's not altogether with it, which is why he's just wasting ammunition, firing forwards into the fields. But all the same, this mortar battery and another one just behind it, this one much more heavily guarded by the enemy's main body of troops, are going to prove problematic. The enemy has lots of this pirate mob, which is a surprisingly powerful unit because they don't have to fire only their single rank at once. They can fire with all troops at the same time, giving them massively higher firepower than their mob status would suggest. Now my random artillery barrage, very fortunately, actually manages to get a direct hit on one of the enemy's mortar pieces, destroying it and killing one of the crewmen. But we can't rely on this. Uh, just waiting to see if my artillery will take the enemy out will not work because my artillery, they're only uh, very low level early game artillery, they're super inaccurate and they're firing at pretty much their maximum operational range. Now, the enemy forces, luckily for me, decided to make an advance after a while, probably because they realised they had an artillery disadvantage in terms of range and thought they would close in to try and take them out. But, of course, that just plays into my hands, because I want them to get as close to me as possible, so that when I engage them, I minimise the amount of time advancing under mortar fire. Now, my artillery actually can't quite fire their maximum range. Their uh, range marker shows further than they're able to fire, so they're not able to actually hit the enemy's infantry until they've moved a bit closer. But now, finally, they're unleashing shots. They're super inaccurate, especially here at the end of their range. But because the enemy is all over the place, these randomly falling shots do manage to kill a couple of them. Not very devastating or damaging. It's not going to have an impact on their numbers. What it does have is an impact on morale to be under attack so soon in the battle and still so far away from their target. So the enemy bunch up and start moving towards me. I have my artillery continually bombard them the whole time. Doesn't really do any damage, but the morale effect is going to be significant. They're all going to be shaken or steady as they come into the fight, rather than confident having already had to walk through that barrage. So I'm now going to prepare to receive them. I've got some militia ready on my right flank and regular line infantry on the left. And on the far left, I've got cavalry. With the cavalry, I don't intend to engage the infantry. I'm going to use this opportunity to go and take out the mortars since the enemy are now only guarding them with a single unit, I might be able to sneak past them and just destroy the mortars, freeing up my ability to move around the field. So the enemy move in, and you can see even as they start fighting, they're already wavering in some cases, because their morale is already shot from the difficult advance under fire. My militia start hitting them with shot, but at the extent of our range here, super inaccurate, only inflicting a few casualties, but the morale hit is enough to turn about two of their four units, so we've immediately made life a lot easier for us. On the left flank, my actual professional line infantry will start engaging as well against these armed citizenry. We don't expect much from these guys, because they're super untrained, even inferior to my militia, so it should be easy enough to wipe them out. 
Now back in the town, my cavalry has rushed through the enemy to attack the first mortar battery. The second battery actually fires on the first one as I arrive, inflicting friendly fire and killing my horsemen at the same time. A desperate move from the second set of mortars. So the first battery is easily overrun and I'm going to immediately charge the second. This is dangerous because the enemy's mob is right there and they could actually gun my cavalry down. Luckily they're facing the other way right now, so I'm relying on them not turning around in time. The main battle continues. The enemy's routing units came back from routing quite fast because they do of course have most of their strength left so they're not really discouraged from fighting, they're just going in and out as the artillery shakes their morale. So I'm going to use this opportunity now to start gradually advancing because we've cleared up some uh, areas that we can safely occupy now that the mortars are taken care of. So I'm going to move up to that wall with the militia and then support them on the right flank with more militia. The enemy routing all over the place are going to give me plenty of opportunities to do this. They can't actually attack me while I'm moving. Back over here where the enemy's mob are still ignoring my cavalry, things are going well. We take out the first mortar team and I tell my cavalry to get out of there. It was at just about this moment the mob actually did turn round. So everything happened with perfect timing as far as I'm concerned. So the cavalry now aren't really needed at the back there, they could come back here to support the main fight. The main fight of course going fine, they're only routing all over the place, but because we're not really damaging them, they're just coming in, taking a volley and routing at the prospect of being hit by another volley and then they come back in a minute later since their units are still at mostly full strength. So we need to sort of advance and try and do some manoeuvres to really entrap these units and get them to engage in a more serious fight, perhaps without the artillery firing at them so that we can deplete them and make them route for good. My cavalry, sneaking away from the massacre of the mortar crew, have drawn the attention of the pirate mob, unfortunately. I order my cavalry to rear charge some armed citizenry back at the main fight. Unfortunately, the mob do stop and get some shots off on the cavalry, inflicting casualties. Luckily, we're not too close. If we'd been closer, it would have done serious damage. Once the cavalry get back, I of course will be able to use them in my entrapment strategy, hitting the enemy from behind, stopping them from routing, and if they do route, slaughtering them to make sure they don't come back. Over here on the far right, a unit of pirate mob was causing me some problems, so I sent in the pikemen to deal with it. What I wanted them to do was form a pike wall at the last second and advance with their pikes, but I don't think it quite works like that. So when I order them to charge, some of them go in with their swords, the other ones get confused about having to form a pike wall at the last second and don't actually do it. But it doesn't really matter because these pikemen are actually trained in melee, unlike the pirate mob, so we're able to just completely overwhelm this unit by swamping them with pikemen. We have numerical superiority there as well. So that unit actually does surprisingly well and wipes one enemy unit off the map. Another unit of citizenry there, destroyed by a cavalry rear charge, allowing my infantry to advance up to look for more targets. At this stage, the battle is going to start swinging drastically in our favour. The enemy is starting to lose the main bodies of their infantry. We're going to make sure we kill significant numbers of the routing troops so that they don't come back. Over here, a similar strategy on the left. I'm rushing pikemen against the enemy's pirate mob. The pirate mob can fire very fast, but the pikemen are to me expendable because they're not going to be useful for too much of the campaign and they're very expensive to upkeep. So in a dark way, the loss of the pikemen isn't too bad. They're a good unit to engage in these dangerous charges against the enemy's better units. So as you can see now, we just need to clear up the enemy. Routing units all over the place. My cavalry will quickly finish off the survivors. My cavalry aren't going to engage here though because the pikemen are going to do just fine finishing off the pirate mob on the left. You see the mob basically being pushed back by just wild sword swings. The pikemen don't actually use their pikes in melee if they're not in pike wall formation, which is curious. They just awkwardly hold them and use their swords, but they're pretty good at what they do and they get the job done. There was one last unit to defeat. I used two units of militia to engage it and then sent my line infantry to do a dangerous flanking maneuver, walking right in front of their unit to set up on a walled position. Luckily, the enemy didn't fire whilst I was running in front of them. And when they finally did fire, they actually fired off to the side at the more distant militia units. So then my line infantry unleashed a close range barrage of accurate fire from their hidden position there and the enemy immediately rounds. That was the last enemy unit being sent off the field. They probably would have come back if the battle had lasted long enough, but as the last unit, the battle can now be ended. So it's a heroic victory for General Van der Sau. The enemy had only a slight advantage at the start of the battle, but we lost so few troops in winning that we've managed to achieve a heroic victory. Antigua, our first new settlement, is ours. Oh, it worries me to no end. Think about how much good money they're throwing at this. Money that I acquired for them over all these years. 
If they had given that money back to me, the flags of all the provinces would be flying from here to the Himalayas, or whatever they call it. You know, the peaks of the crown of India. Oh, it doesn't matter. The point is that they could have at least consulted me. I feel rather passed over. And now we'll hear nothing but news of the Western Company until it fails again, all the while smothering my achievements with their notable failures. I'll force the ships to stop sailing for a month or two. Then the States General would have a medal on my chest with such speed you'd think they'd tunneled through the earth to reach me. For relatively minor losses, the pirate garrison has been wiped out, and interestingly, after the cavalry, it was the pikemen who did the majority of the work, killing far more enemies than they lost among their own number, proving that these melee troops are superior in the right situation. So Antigua is ours, the first territorial gain of the West India Company's new campaign here in the Americas. I'm going to restore some of the more important troops, spending what little money I have left. And now we're going to look onto our next target, which is Trinidad and Tobago, another pirate settlement. Taking these pirate settlements will be useful because I don't have to declare war on anyone in order to take them, so we're sneakily expanding our territory under the noses of the other powers. Nearby I also control the island of Curaçao, where Admiral Jared Callenba is controlling a very small fleet, just defending the port against pirates for now, but in the future we're going to have to build it up to make it a strong presence in the area. We also control the very important province of Dutch Guinea. This is an exceedingly rich area with tons of natural resources, including gold and gemstones, making it very valuable. It's also next door to a small French holding, which is relatively valuable as well. So if we ever happen to be at war with France, that'll be a very interesting and easy acquisition to make. Now let's jump back into the home theatre, Europe, to have a quick look at our situation here. It's the capital, Amsterdam, where we have a small army under General Van Veldek, who isn't really going to see much action, at least hopefully not. But we're building up a force to defend the capital just in case something happens here on the mainland. Right now, I'm not planning to take any action on the mainland until I finish my preparations. We have a small navy there, led by uh, Admiral Almande, I think he's called. And now jumping over to India, we have again a very small army inside Ceylon a particularly valuable province as well, lots of natural resources. Its tiny army is led by General Castor and he is being helped by a minister, Gradstyke, to convert the population. You can see there's loads of different religions on this island and we're going to try and convert them to Protestantism. The island itself soon set to grow thanks to all the investment we've put into it. I'm also building a new fifth rate here so that I can recruit an admiral because currently we have no command on the seas in the region. Now a major problem for India is that our trade routes back home are being raided by pirates but right now my fleet is actually busy here in the East Indies. You can see I've used all of my ships in the area to basically establish a total monopoly on all of these trade routes here in the East Indies. We've got flutes on most of them, our merchantmen equivalent to a very powerful trading ship. And we have plenty of ships left over to try and capture the final trade post which is currently being guarded by a small pirate fleet. So we are going to head in with our fleet, it's superior in terms of power, so we're hoping to be able to beat them and then leave ships behind to continue trading, completing our monopoly of the East Indies in order for the rest to continue west and go and deal with the other pirates raiding the trade routes home, which of course is stopping half the money getting out of the East Indies. So the enemy fleet shouldn't be anything special, it's three Zebex. They're superior to some of my smaller ships and inferior to my larger ones. Overall, we do have an advantage in the battle. Here's the fleet on the sea making its approach towards the pirates position. A lovely evening, although a little bit wet, it's not going to make too much of a difference for us. So we have the standard European styles of ship available in this battle. Here you can see a sixth rate, a solid battleship with high maneuverability, although not all that powerful. Most of our ships are not particularly powerful in this battle, but they will do the job. Here's another minor ship, a brig, cheap to recruit, easy to maneuver, and with a captain it seems who would rather sit above his men <laughs> and watch from on top of the mast. A dangerous position of course because if they get demasted he will be in trouble so he's taking a risk. We've got a second brig and we've got a sloop at the back of the line. The sloop being the weakest and least useful of our ships with the fewest guns. But the main feature of this fleet is our trading ships. The flutes which have absolutely tons of guns, several decks, bristling with marines on top ready to repel borders. This is a powerful ship that severely outclasses what the pirates have brought to this fight. So with my line of ships ready we're going to advance with the wind towards the enemy's position. It's going to be a slow run but we'll get there eventually and you can see here 
On the back of the fluid, how ornately decorated it is, a sign of the East India Company's wealth, no doubt, that they're sending these gilded ships into battle on their behalf. So all we have to do now is approach the distant pirate fleet, which you can see is very slowly moving towards us. They're probably struggling slightly against the wind. As the two lines get close, they both peel off in order to start exchanging broadsides with each other. I am happy for this to be the case because my broadsides are going to be stronger overall, especially because the enemy's ships, the Zebex, have some of their guns facing forwards, meaning some of their firepower won't be useful in this situation. So we are going to basically form a parallel line to the enemy, or at least that's how I started making my formation. A little bit later, I decided I'd actually curve around and travel right towards the enemy's line, sailing with the wind. This little kink I've put in the line now allows me to fire a quick broadside off with each ship at the enemy and then while they reload, close the distance to engage them at close range. Once we get in closer, the leading ship, the flute, is able to start firing at the back of the enemy's line, which is quite handy. Although distant shots won't do all that much damage, I'm uh, more anticipating the close-range fire we're going to get against these enemy ships once we've gone right through their bearing. Once we're in the middle of their line, we can of course fire both to the left and the right simultaneously, hitting ships trailing and leading. The leading ship takes a massive volley of fire at relatively close range into its stern, which unnerves the crew. The ship, though, still not that damaged, we're going to have to do plenty more like this to damage it more fully. So each one of our ships is now going to get a chance to go through the enemy's line and smash them with shot, and we're going to turn around, as you can see, uh, once we're through in order to continue bombardment. Here you can see one of my brigs, the crew firing from their single deck, not doing all that much damage to the distant enemy Zebek, but coming in now to get in between two enemy ships where they're going to have a nice chance to do damage. So with almost all my ships come through the line now, the enemy line is going to start curving away and we're going to have to start actually reacting. Luckily for me, their leading ship's been demasted, meaning it can barely move. This ship's kind of stuck actually, so it's a sitting duck for our line to come back around and finish it off. I'm just going to leave it and now focus on their trailing ship. It is demastered at this moment as well, meaning it's stuck as well. At this point, this battle is getting easier and easier. De ce que l'on sache déjà, il est très possible d'imaginer la scène qui se déroule. Les armées hollandaises disparaissent d'Amsterdam, avec une partie de leur navire. Ensuite, des rumeurs d'une nouvelle société de négoces hollandaises surfacent. Ce n'est pas difficile à voir qu'ils vont commencer une nouvelle campagne aux Amériques. Une campagne qui mènera une forte perte pour nous et nos alliés. Et qu'est-ce que je voudrais demander à ces nobles seigneurs J'envoierai tout de suite un message vers nos colonies américaines. Que tout navire portant les couleurs hollandaises doit être coulé à tout prix. Si vous n'êtes pas de mon avis, alors je ne peux être responsable pour les conséquences. Demastered ships make for easy targets for the Dutch sailors. Here you can see a massive volley of cannon shot tearing apart this Zebek, which is thoroughly surrounded by the Dutch sailors at this point. You can see their morale still holding up surprisingly well, despite their ship in terrible condition, and the, the Dutch line snaking around them with tons of different broadsides aiming at the same ship at once, plus the outer side of the line still able to fire at other demastered targets sitting out there. So overall, a pretty decent use of of our Navy's firepower here. Here you can see a brig coming into point-blank range. Here I wanted to see whether a point-blank range broadside would do massive damage to the enemy ship. Most of the shots actually miss though. They sail over the top since the enemy ship sits so low in the water. Probably better to use grape shot in that case and try and kill the crew. Perhaps I'll learn for next time, but the ship is doomed anyway because the enemy's trailing ship surrendered, freeing up more of my own boats to come surround the enemy. Soon, the battle is pretty much over. The enemy, being battered by our shots now, all surrender. It's a heroic victory in our first naval engagement. The pirates in the East Indies have been cleared out. On the battle results screen, we learn that we managed to capture two of the enemy ships, one of the other ones apparently being too damaged and must have been sunk or scuttled. So with these two ships, I could take them into my fleet, but instead I'm going to sell them for prize money because I don't foresee having two damaged Sebex in the fleet being particularly useful. So the enemy fleet very slowly <laughs> sinks to the bottom of the sea on the campaign map. Order. 
This means we now have free reign over the East Indies. There are no other fleets but our own here. So we can send a fleet to take up position here on the final trade node. And the remaining ships are going to head back to India where they'll repair at the docks at Ceylon, meet up with the new fifth rate that's being recruited and their new admiral. And then they can go and continue their pirate hunting in Madagascar. Back in the Americas, I was looking at Antigua and realised that the public order situation means that not only can I really tax them, I'm not going to be able to move the garrison out for a long time, so it seems that here in the Americas, things are going to have to rest for a little while before they continue. I did, though, send a brig down to the coast of Brazil to see if there were any trading opportunities, and it turns out there were no one occupying the first two trade nodes. So I occupy the first, and I'm going to send another brig that I've constructed locally to go and do the same. I was going to use these ships as part of the local fleet, but right now they're probably more useful just sitting on the trade nodes, getting some trade going and making sure other powers can't sit on them without declaring war on me. So here in Antigua, the public order is not going to resolve for a very long time. They have this resistance to invaders, which is absolutely through the roof. It seems these pirates do not want to be controlled by the new West India Company, but we're going to have to attempt to keep them under control. Now back here in the main theatre Europe, the main worry for me is the Spanish army. They have a settlement there in Belgium and they historically have been at war with the United Provinces a fair bit. There's a decent chance they'll come back. I've got a very small force garrisoning the area. We'll have to see if it stands up to any attacks that may occur. You can also see I'm going, I've gone straight into research empiricism. This will allow my technology to improve at a faster rate and it unlocks higher level academic buildings. We're going to be doing a technological race here as the United Provinces. We want to get as much tech as possible, especially ones that aid in trade income. Here's the diplomatic situation. You can see it's awful. Almost everyone in the world is aligned against the United Provinces except England, probably because we're Protestant and because we're a republic, two things that are relatively rare here in the rest of the world. So most people aren't too on board with us. Plus, this is on very hard difficulty, which probably makes things even worse. In particular, Spain and France, two massive enemies who are allied to each other and don't like me at all, could present problems. We do have a couple of allies. We've got Hanover and Westphalia, two small German states to our east, which provides us a nice buffer of protection in Europe, which is very handy, although I did have to pay for those alliances. Now, as we move on, I get an interesting offer from the Maratha Confederacy, the rebels in India. They're offering a region trade and military alliance in exchange for a small payment. And the region they want to give me is basically the land next to Ceylon. So I'd just be trading places there. And that region is actually worth a lot more than Ceylon. This is a deal that would make me a lot of money in principle. But because that area is so undefensible and because the Maratha Confederacy don't really like me, neither do the Mughal Empire. I wasn't willing to move into mainland India without really doing preparations first. Now we've got some bad news, which is that a massive pirate fleet has blockaded the docks at Curaçao, blockading my smaller fleet inside. It's unlikely they'd be able to win in a breakout, so we need to reinforce, but we don't really have any boats near. I've got a sloop over at Antigua and those brigs I sent to Brazil who could come back. There's also a race-built galleon blockading the docks at Dutch Guinea, a very powerful ship that none of our ships can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with. Overall, the pirates have us in a bit of a situation here. We need to build up more more strength in the area where we can still build things. Over in India, I'm recruiting the Admiral into the new fifth rate that's been constructed. So we now have a sizable fleet here, and this fleet is going to head down to Madagascar, as I said, taking our boats not only to defeat the pirates, but of course to start occupying these trade nodes, which currently they're all unoccupied. So we have a chance, if we're very fast, to put one boat on each and gain a monopoly here in Madagascar which would give us the chance to become extremely rich. Now over in the Americas, I decided to use my sloop to scout Trinidad and Tobago to see if I could take it with like one or two units. The garrison was quite big, it almost definitely has mortars in the garrison, and the pirates are actually upgrading the infrastructure, which is quite nice of them. So at least when I do take it, it's not going to be in a shambles. Now finally, as I move into the next turn, we get some disastrous news. France declares war on me, calling in their massive allies, Spain, the Maratha Confederacy, and Austria, among smaller ones. It seems pirates aren't going to be my main concern. We'll see how this develops next time. The Eighty Years' War had taught the United Provinces a lesson it could not forget. That the profits of trade funded war, and war brought new chances for trade. It was a way to turn the cycle of destruction into a cycle of growth. 
The Dutch were not going to fight their wars for land, ambition or even revenge. They were going to fight to control the markets of the world. This objective, above all others, would bring them such wealth that if one day they desired a campaign of conquest, even on the European mainland, they would have the sinews of war readily at hand. And for this goal they had at their disposal ships among the world's finest and a young, eager nation with everything to prove. Thank you so much for watching the first episode of Sinews of War. There'll be a new episode every week, so if you want to stay on top of them, make sure you're subscribed, and I hope you'll join me next time to see how the United Provinces fares. Thanks.